Uh, Trish, and what an absolutely lovely piece of film and a lovely song. Um, it is coming to the end, but we have got this wonderful treat for you now of our closing speaker. Um, it is my very great pleasure to do the introduction for Kate. Um, I will give a little bit of a biography, but I'm sure everybody knows and has read about Kate. Um, she started her career as a reporter, producer, executive producer, editor, working in the media. And from 2009, she was director of news at the ABC, leading 1,400 journalists and production staff around Australia and 11 international bureaus. She was a member of the ABC's executive leadership team and reported to the MD, managing a $200 million divisional budget, which I think is almost as much as some university libraries. Um, <laughs> Uh, she was announced as the new CEO of the State Library of Victoria in July 2015. Um, and of course, we all know and love the State Library of Victoria. It's, it's the state's oldest cultural institution, one of our busiest public libraries, and it has about 1.8 million visitors each year in, in the bricks and mortar world and 3.3 million visits online. So Kate has inherited a very beautiful, wonderful um, structure. Um, Kate asked me in introducing her to stress the point that she is new to the industry, but she comes with uh, a wealth of experience from that media, media area which is all about storytelling and about communicating information. I would also like to add to that that having spoken to Kate and also coming myself from outside the industry over a dozen years ago, um, Kate and I both I think share an enormous respect for the role of library and information professionals and for what can be achieved. And I, I sense that Kate is going through the same experience I had those years ago when I came in thinking, oh yes, libraries, that's nice. And, and within a week or two, I, I was blown away by what was achieved by the sector. So it's very great pleasure to introduce Kate Tawney. Hello, everyone. We're almost there, and I'm so conscious that I'm the only thing standing between you and a drink at the end of the conference, so this is a tough gig. Stick with me. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we gather today. I'm delighted to be in South Australia with you. As mentioned, I'm a journalist, and I've jumped on the li library bandwagon late in your journey because I firmly believe that the library sector is the place to be in this age of disruption. And this was reinforced for me shortly after I was appointed to the role of CEO of the State Library of Victoria when my 83-year-old mother rang me. And before I tell you that story, a little bit of context. Running ABC News was an incredible privilege, um, but there were some occupational hazards in regularly defending our role against criticism from political, media and community circles was one. And that was all fair and reasonable. The ABC is a public broadcaster and should be accountable. But it did mean that in a role like mine, you had to have a pretty thick skin. So that's the context, and that's quite important in this story, because my mum rang me to tell me that she'd had a 3 a.m. moment the night after I told her that I was joining the library. What if I had outstanding books from my childhood borrowing in Ballarat? <laughs> in the early hours, she had convinced herself that this was a potential scandal worthy of a Herald Sun front page. <laughs> Depending on the number of overdue books, she was convinced that the story might well have made it to the pages of the Australian. And by 5 a.m., it was a Four Corners expose. <laughs> so at 10 o'clock on the dot the next morning, she marched down to the Ballarat Library to cut a deal on my behalf, <laughs> unbeknown to me, so keeping in mind, this gorgeous, loyal, beautiful woman had not slept a wink, and she explained to the librarian that she needed to check her daughter's lending record. And the librarian explained that there were a few privacy issues uh, that they needed to work through, and she asked my mother very diplomatically how old I was. Not how old my mother was, but how old I was. My mother told her that I was in my 40s, and as my mother described it later, the librarian looked at her and then diplomatically asked whether or not there was anything stopping me coming into the library or getting online to check my own borrowing record. My mother then explained that I was about to join the State Library and if the Herald Sun discovered that I had overdue books, 
she was worried that I might never be able to take up this wonderful new job, which did make me think that clearly my role at the ABC had a big impact on my mother. Faced with this, the librarian didn't argue her logic. Instead, she looked earnestly at my mum and asked when might have been the last time that I'd borrowed. In the 1980s, my mum said. And the wonderful librarian said, well, look, let's assume that your daughter's record is clean. And if she ever finds a Ballarat library book from the 1980s, you let her know that it's our gift to her to congratulate her on her new job. The librarian, um, she chatted to uh, my mum further and, and uh, ended up signing her up or pointing her in the right direction to a digital literacy program. And my mum left with a new friend, a spring in her step because she was going to learn how to organise photos on her iPad and with the satisfaction that she had helped me avoid a scandalous start to my new job. And I was left thinking, how great are libraries? And how great is my mum? 18 months ago, I would never have imagined that I'd be standing speaking to you today as CEO of the State Library. Then I was a journalist with 22 years experience with the ABC and I found myself leading a news team of 1,400 people at a time of extraordinary disruption and transformation in media. And so what was the path from the ABC studios to the beautiful, beautiful building, uh, the State Library in Melbourne? Well, quite simply, I spent an afternoon at the library and when I emerged, I walked down that grand staircase at the entrance past the statue of our library founder, Redmond Barry, standing tall in a forecourt which was swarming with people and I left desperately wanting to be part of the library industry, of your industry. Because in four hours, I'd seen a snapshot of a sector which is thriving on disruption. I'd had a glimpse of an industry which is making the most of the technology tsunami and is redefining its role. And I had shared a beautiful space in its services and collections with people from all walks of life and all generations. And you see, for the past decade, I've been passionate and I've been focused on three things in my career. One, how to retain the value and the relevance in information services in a rapidly changing environment and specifically how to build on the very best of the storytelling and information sharing traditions developed over 80 years of ABC News and Current Affairs and to ensure that those services are valued by audiences now and well into the future. So how to take a program like Four Corners on air for 55 years and ensure that it not only survives a shift from analog to digital, but thrives for another half century. The second thing I've been focused on is how to ensure that the services we offered Australians were valued by and relevant to all Australians. How to ensure that we not only talked about diversity, but we delivered content and services and programs which reflected the community in which we lived. And three, how to partner with the community in shaping the future. And when I walked into the State Library this time last year and immersed myself in the space and the collections for a single afternoon, I saw my three passion projects together in action. Here was a thriving example of a disrupted ind industry defying odds to reinvent itself and emerge stronger and busier than ever before. And here was a truly egalitarian institution a grand space which catered for and therefore attracted people from all walks of life. And here was a 160 year old institution genuinely collaborating with the community to unlock the value in a $388 million collection through innovative online interactive programs. The matrix I'd been pondering and shaping and redefining in media with my colleagues for 10 years was suddenly in action before me. My media colleagues and I had looked to many, many different industries to learn from others on our journey, but I'm ashamed to say that we never looked to libraries. And I'll come back to that. I was a regular in my local library with my kids, but I didn't run a professional lens across what was transpiring in the sector as a whole. So for me on that day, learning about what you'd all been quietly achieving over the past decade was a revelation 
And as a person who'd spent more than two decades finding and sharing stories, I think I can reliably assure you that the story of libraries in Australia over the past decade is a cracking one. And I believe it's a story that's yet to be told properly. In my view, telling that story should be our number one priority because done properly and done together, it will lay the foundations for all of us to be able to build a vibrant future for libraries in Australia. A future in which libraries are absolutely essential services, much loved and valued by the people that they serve. Everyone loves a library, but across the sector, are we essential in some way to enough people? Again, more on that later. I've thought a lot about what sets libraries apart from other sectors facing significant change as a result of technology, and it's been valuable to hear your thoughts over the past few days. My early observation is that this sector has an ability to partner with the community, whether it be local, academic, specialist or professional, to shape the future, and that's a strong factor in your success. While other sectors consult the, uh, consult the community or their customers, or while other sectors pay consultants to speak to their target audiences, libraries are at the coalface, listening, adapting, learning and delivering. Very simple and very successful. And it seems to me that the library sector is less afraid than other sectors to let go, to hand the reins over to the public and to be told where to next by the people who are on the journey with them. We've recently had an experience of this through the redevelopment project, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. And as part of it, we're scoping a children's space. Many of us have children, many of us have views on what we'd love to see in a children's space, but none of us are children. And so we ask the experts. I like how the state library is really big and it's like free space for study and it's very quiet. I I felt like I was in a big cave that no one's there. It was so silent, so you can do silent things. I never get silent in my house. The co-design process for Vision 2020 is about engaging with the, I guess, the future users of the, the library. The main reason we've, we've decided to, to work through a co-design process is because the, the needs of your audience are just crucial. If you're going to design a space for a particular group of people, the first thing you need to do is actually ask them what they want. This morning we were visited by people from the State Library and they asked our Grade 5, 6 students to come up with some ideas about how to design the new library spaces. I thought there was like a, enough spaces to read and study. I was thinking of maybe table tennis, like somewhere else. We could use the ping pong table and rock climbing when someone's studying really hard for a whole day at the library and then they might need a break and go maybe play ping pong or something, yeah. So today we've attended the Baby Bounce and the storytelling sessions that the library hold every week and we asked the family members, along with their children, to actually engage with us and tell us what they want in their big dream library. So we actually brought them into the space that is going to be the child centre in the new redevelopment of the library and just telling them to imagine if anything was a possibility what it is that they want. So this morning we were running co-design workshops with students from Upway High School um, and we wanted to think a little bit about how they might use the library spaces. State libraries like massive and some of the desks are like old and we were just thinking of like putting a modern edge to it. So like with the big walls and everything it just reminds you of how small you are. We might be able to have a place where we don't necessarily have to be quiet all the time. We can be in a group studying together and sharing our ideas. The State Library is a big place in our city and like a lot of people are going in there so to be one of the four schools that are like given a chance to have our word in how it's going to be made and everything is pretty cool. So user design of spaces, co-design programs, uh, services is something that many of you will have been applying for years and I think it's going to be increasingly important for libraries. For an organisation like the State Library of Victoria with a vast collection of books, manuscripts, film, 
audio, ephemera, maps and so much more, we know that the public can bring uh, our collection to life in ways that we can't even imagine. And we see that every year through the wonderful fellowship programs that we run and the results are inspiring. And we know that the Wilder collection, the buildings and the architecture are absolutely breathtaking. The 160 year old heritage we've inherited and we've inherited is built by people, library users and library staff and their passion, their knowledge, their creativity, their curiosity, their patience, their work ethic and their commitment to an understanding of the community is invaluable. My colleagues, Sarah Slade, Deborah Rosenfeld and Janice De Vanderveld, who are all here today, are great examples of that. And this has been visible in every single library that I've visited since I've been in this role, from universities, schools, specialist libraries to public, state and national libraries. My impression is that library, librarians and library uh, staff have demonstrated a capacity for inf innovation and creativity with a razor sharp focus on the people that they are serving. And it was, this was very clear to me the day that I sat in the State Library 12 months ago and had my epiphany. And it was reinforced a few months later when, as new CEO of the library, I opened a, start, a staff art exhibition. And it's a beautiful idea in which staff were asked to take library cards and little red pe pencils and to simply create something that represented their views and thoughts on the library. And it's an exhibition. So some staff focused on the building and capturing in really intricate detail beautiful parts of the building, but so many also focused on our users. And I think my favourite, this, these were silhouettes of staff and anyone who works at the State Library could identify these staff uh, immediately. So very intimate uh, um, pieces of art. But my favourite was this. Um, it's titled Last to Leave and it's a portrait of a homeless man who spends his days at the library and is often the last to leave. He's part of the library family, staff know and love him and I think this just portrait captures uh, his, him with such a tenderness that just illustrates that a knowledge of community is so important in libraries. Libraries have never been just about books. They have always been about people, about communities and communities within communities. And while I think that that's been a driver in the success of libraries in recent years, how do we continue to evolve in a world in which change is constant? How do we build the kinds of networks, partnerships and community support to ensure a sustainable and vibrant future? What and where are the opportunities for libraries in the next stage of this digital roller coaster? And how do we proceed down that path together? I have so much to learn about this sector and your professional generosity has been humbling. Uh, on the flip side of having so much to take in, I have nothing to unlearn. I have no baggage. I have little understanding of the politics that inevitably exists as it does in every sector. And I have absolutely no interest in the formal or informal hierarchies which may or may not exist across different library groups. Quite simply, I firmly believe that our value and our future depends on our capacity to have one voice. Whether we're government, TAFE, state or national libraries, school, research, university, private or public libraries, we can all make our individual cases for the value for our services and our institutions, and we should, but it's the collective library narrative which will set us apart and strengthen our ability to advocate for our own libraries and for our own communities and patrons. I think Patricia and Sue and Alia have done really important work in shaping that narrative. And here's a snapshot which many of you will be familiar with. 12.9 million users over 13,000 libraries, 5,000 members, 27,000 employees, and $2.8 billion in expenditure. That is a sizable and growing industry, serving a significant percentage of the population and generating real value in the Australian economy. And yet few people outside this sector know about it. There are much smaller sectors with much louder voices getting much more attention from policy and decision makers than libraries. 
our combined story is compelling and our shared aspirations for the future are too. The State Library of Victoria, one of Australia's oldest public libraries, was created in the 1850s to be a great emporium of learning. They're not my words, they're the words of uh, Redmond Barrier, who I mentioned earlier. And he's the founding father of the State Library and his imposing form, a granite statue, graces the entrance of the library. Sir so Redmond was also the first chancellor and founding father of the University of Melbourne and the statue depicts him with his college cap in one hand and a book in the other. His principles and those of his Melbourne cohort at the time remain the bedrock of the State Library today, 160 years later. A place of knowledge, creativity, enterprise, innovation, where everyone is welcome and where access to information is free, the People's University. The library was charged with preserving Victoria's heritage by collecting items of historical and cultural significance for future generations. And back then, in 1856, when the doors first opened, the only conditions to entry were that you had to be over the age of 14, of respectable appearance, and your hands had to be clean. When the library first opened, it contained 4,000 volumes of the best books on every subject, many personally selected by Sir Redmond. Today, the State Library of Victoria boasts almost 5 million items, and each year we add another 70,000 to the collection. On an average day, 5,000 people walk into the library, and there are 11,000 online visits to our website. Like many of you, at opening time, there's a queue of people to, to waiting to get in, and that's terrific, unless you're one of the many people who can't find a seat in the library. So recognising this, the Victorian Government last year announced a $55.4 million contribution to the library's redevelopment project, Vision 2020. This project will increase the public space in the library by 40% and includes the restoration of our beautiful Queen's Hall, the original reading room. The Ian Potter Foundation has generously supported the Queen's Hall restoration with a donation of $10 million. As part of our plans, we're building new spaces, as I mentioned, and services for children, young people and entrepreneurs, along with a gallery to showcase the best of the state's collection. Building begins next year and will be completed by 2020. Here's a quick snapshot of the project. The State Library is our oldest and most significant cultural institution, and that tells Victoria's story and it makes information and learning and knowledge available to all Victorians free. We're very keen to um, make sure that the library is reinvented for the modern community and, and we've got a building that really fulfills its capabilities for Victoria. I think what's vital is that it doesn't lose its heritage, it doesn't lose what it's always been and the values that it's always offered to the Victorian community, but at the same time it has got to give each new generation what it wants and has a right to expect. We want to redevelop the Queen's Hall to turn that again into the most beautiful public reading room and events room in Victoria and in Australia. And if this space were reinvigorated and restored, then this would be another space where people could come in and enjoy each other's company as well as using the resources of the library. I come here and it's just expanded my horizon. <laughs> there is plenty of opportunities to be innovative and creative with it. We want to have a centre for digital futures that explores the future of digital devices and, and the digital revolution. We want to have a centre for entrepreneurship. Public information and knowledge is a really important source of information. The E-Town Hall will really draw people together, connect and just expand on the community hub. The library, just like any public building, needs to be well configured to the needs of the modern community. We think this is a project not just for Melbourne but for all of Victoria. So it's a great time to be at the library, but as Vicki McDonald just uh, pointed out in a previous session, 
Uh, there can be a tension when you have big capital projects, um, but a stress on the operational budget. And so after many years of lo lobby lobbying, prior to my time, I can take no credit for it whatsoever, we were delighted last year to receive uh, further good news uh, when the uh, Creative Victoria Creative Industries Minister of Victoria, Martin Foley, announced an additional $5 million to support the library's operations and to the complete funding over $20 million of a second stage of the Ballarat storage facility, ensuring the safe storage of wonderful and growing collection. It's an incredible sign of confidence in the library sector in Victoria, and we hope that it becomes a benchmark for support across the sector, locally and nationwide. And to be clear, the injection of funding has come after years of budget pressure and advocacy by my predecessor and the likes of Justine Hyde and Sarah Slade and the SLV executive team. And it's also the result of a very deliberate strategic decision uh, to articulate the role of the library in terms of the broader economic, cultural, entrepreneurial and education e ecosystems. How can the library support the aspirations of those sectors? What role can the library play in helping deliver on local, state and national initiatives? It's not rocket science, but it's surprising how often organisations and individuals resort to problem-focused focused advocacy. And I learnt that uh, lesson very early in my career as a young uh, producer. I was producing a program called Insiders and I went to my boss to argue for more resources. I detailed all the things my colleagues and I were unable to achieve because of budget pressure. And I beautifully articulated all the hurdles we faced and how much money I need to get over them. My boss listened intently and at the end of the meeting he picked up my paper submission for more funding, opened his filing cabinet and with a wry smile he pulled out a folder marked unsolvable problems <laughs> and he told me to get back to work. And a few months later I reframed my approach and handed him a file marked problems solved and the wry smile emerged again. He took the folder without saying a word and about a week later, the business manager informed me that I'd got two thirds of what I'd asked for. But think about your own workplace. Think about the colleagues who inspire you, the people who you really enjoy, enjoy working with and for. For me, it's the people who are problem solvers. Um, seek your advice in solving the problem rather than sharing the problem. It's not the Pollyannas who brush things under the carpet, it's those who recognise the issue but refuse to be bogged down by what can't be done and instead focus on what can be achieved or the best possible outcome. And applied to advocacy on all levels, it means identifying the problem we're trying to solve on behalf of the person in front of us and sharing the solution. So for the minister, for the local councillor, for the vice chancellor, for the CEO, for the chair of your board, you're usually one, the queue of people with needs and aspirations. So what problem are you solving for them? How are you helping them achieve their goals? When they look in their diary and they see that, that you, they've got an appointment with you, you want to be the one that they look forward to seeing. You want to be the one who clearly states the issues, outlines the op options for solutions and articulates what uh, you need from them. I moved back uh, to my home state of Victoria from New South Wales to take up my new job and it was shortly before the release of the Victorian Creative Industries Strategy Creative State. And I urge you to have a look because it's a really unique approach to supporting the creative sector and recognising the broader contribution made by it. The strategy is matched with a $115 million investment to develop and keep the best creative talent across the sector and enable Victorians to undertake ambitious, inter internationally recognised work. The State Library of Victoria is proud to be a central hub of that expanding economic, social and community sector. And earlier this year, we began work revising our vision statement and expanding our strategy in alignment with Creative State. The process has involved mediated community, stakeholder and staff workshops, just as many of you will have held in your own strategic sessions. We asked the basic questions, why are we here? What's our purpose? How do we hold on to the best of the past in shaping our future? Our vision is a library for all in a changing world and our purpose, importantly, is inspiring possibilities. 
Most mornings when I arrive at the State Library, I deliberately walk through the empty, uh, domed reading room. It's the most incredible space. It's still, the shelves are beautifully stacked. And I imagine all the individuals in that particular day and all their individual pursuits. And I imagine over 160 years, all the individuals who've spent time there being inspired. So I think inspiring possibilities is precisely what a library and our library in particular does. We have four main goals. The first is people at the heart and genuinely putting people at the heart. It's so easy to say, but it's much harder to do. Uh, this is our first goal because this will drive all of our decision making. For all of us, we need to make decisions around where we're putting resources, how we move resources around the organisation and how we invest more in our digital services. And I think if you are very clear about ensuring that you measure what you do on a regular basis with people at the heart of your strategies, then I think it's easier to be making those decisions and it's easier to be uh, building a rationale for those decisions as well. The second goal is no barriers, being accessible to everyone and welcoming to all. And we want to be a world leader in access engagement and diversity in library services and programs. And we are unashamedly ambitious around that. We do want to be a world leader and we want to ensure that we are setting the bar high. Goal three is open and inviting, really thinking through how we ensure that we capture the imagination of our users now and into the future, understanding who's not using the library and coming up with uh, exhibitions and programs that surprise and delight. And this is a lovely example of one. The Poison Cabinet is an interactive experience designed for 16 to 18 year olds which runs throughout the State Library. It's just a lot of fun, it's a big game. It's a great way to introduce them just to the idea that a library is a fun place to be, that they can go there and have an experience. Because we're partnering with La Trobe University, there's a lot of stuff in there about education and like what am I interested in, what is the thing that fires me and makes me want to study. The Poison Cabinet connected us to, the, to young people in a way that we sometimes struggle to do in universities. You know, we have a lot of public events and um, sometimes it can be a struggle to, to get young 16, 18 year olds engaged with the university in a really exciting and creative and constructive way. Uh, and I feel as though this, this particular event really did that. We're really engaging with the, the, the youngsters who are going to come to university and be part of our community. It was exciting and you never knew what was going to be behind the next door. Being in the library when it's dark and after hours, yeah, it's really cool as well. I feel the sound played a really good role in heightening the experience. It added tension, really heightened the atmosphere. The best part for me was working with new people. The fact that you could really just put aside your differences and focus on the challenge. My favourite part was the dark room because that required the most teamwork and it was the most satisfying to complete. The Poison Cabinet was a fantastic opportunity for La Trobe University to work with the State Library to create a really unique experience for young people. The beauty of this project is that it was developed in close partnership. It was a collaborative project with La Trobe University. We were very clear about the goals and the values of both organisations and matching those. We were also very focused on creating a unique and interesting experience for young people. The Poison Cabinet project has given young people the opportunity to really connect with the library and we're hoping that now that they see this place as a place for them, it's their place, that they will come back again and again throughout their lives. I would definitely recommend it to one of my friends. 
was a program, I just wanted to bring my friends the following weekend and do that. It looked so much fun. And I think the part of that is, um, is really partnering and being genuine partners and allowing others to tell us how we can unlock uh, the collection. And the fourth goal is a library for the future. This is about being a proud world leader in contemporary li library services and spaces, but it's also about learning from all of you and acknowledging the great things that you're doing and being a generous partner in this sector and sharing skills and experience inside and outside the library sector. So we want to be a library for the future, not just in bricks and mortar, um, or in the ways that we're co presenting our collection, but also in financial sustainability. As CEO, I am, uh, make no apology for saying we must never be afraid of seeking alternatives to fund our ambitious programs. Demand on the public purse is increasing at a local, state and national level, and so we need to be more accountable than ever before. And that means reviewing how we spend our money on a regular basis, reviewing the way in which we measure our success, uh, in every service and, and every program that we fund. And we need to be able to clearly demonstrate our value. And to do that, we need reliable data and metrics. And I'm taking so many great ideas away uh, from the conference on this. So thank you to all of uh, those who have shared what you're doing in that space with me. One of my media colleagues used to have this wonderful phrase to describe gut instinct. He referred to it as the tummy compass. And there's no room for the tummy compass uh, alone in assessing whether our services or programs are working. We do need to be able to demonstrate value because only then can we make the case for further support, safe in the knowledge that every cent spent is invested well. A study conducted for the State Library uh, Victoria and the Public Libraries Network Victoria, a deeply impressive group run by the inspiring Patty Manolis from Geelong, found that if for every dollar spent on libraries, there is a $3.56 return benefit to the community. And many of you will have completed similar work. For regular library users, that figure will come as no surprise to the student who uses the library to access free Wi-Fi, to the academics and researchers wanting access to specialist material, to the readers wanting free access to, to reading material each week, to parents wanting story time sessions for their children, to those who don't have a computer at home, to those seeking a quiet space to study, to those wanting access to business tools, to tools the list goes on and on. Those people can me measure the value of their local library for them as individuals. But continuing to focus on measuring that value across our sector and reminding ourselves, our patrons, our boards, our funders and our stakeholders of the benefit of our collective contribution is vital for us. Expanding on the work that Alia has done to explore new ways to measure and communicate value is, in my view, critically important. And I suspect that there may be some in the audience thinking through all the reasons why it might be just too complex to come up with a truly robust methodology to measure value across different sectors within a sector. You've possibly been there, done that. It'd be thoroughly understandable for some of you to form the view that this is the aspiration of a naive newcomer who doesn't quite understand the bespoke nature of the different libraries guilty as charged, um, but I think that's possibly one of my greatest gifts to this sector, because my mantra is why not? When you don't know the size of the hurdles that you're facing, they're not daunting, you simply climb over them or you navigate your way around them. And 10 years ago, I might have had the same view in relation to measuring the value of a public broadcaster, but with help from people with the right skills, and the time to trial and test a methodology. We did come up with an internal framework which was refined over and over again and continues to be refined. Because the reality of the world that we live in is that we might want order, but the world's messy. Change is messy and it's okay. We might not get it right immediately, but we've got to try. Data alone, of course, won't capture the value of libraries, but data combined with the stories of the people who use our spaces and services becomes a powerful tool. And here are a couple of examples uh, of some of those stories from the State Library. 
Right. I'm a broadcaster, so you can tell. As a society, we're starting to return a bit to storytelling and we've got this fabulous place just absolutely full of them and they define us. They are what we are. We must have central repositories, particularly of this type of social history. It will inform generations. Um, my husband and I have lived in King Lake and we were present on Black Saturday. We were very lucky to end the day alive, but um, everything we owned had gone. A 60 condolence books to be collected for any reason is quite remarkable. But people from all over the world sign those books. And it is something that connects us all. To have these in preservable form is phenomenally important. My life has changed from good because of the library and, and the accessibility of so much resources. This is the pivotal point of, uh, of, of the Victorian community. I, I might be stretching it, but this is the state library. Illiteracy is a nightmare that no child should ever have to experience. 2000 and Eight is when, when my older brother discovered the State Library. And we walked in and uh, the first question was, is it free? <laughs> and that was, the, that's, that was when the obsession began. I couldn't read or write, but I was fascinated by the books that had a lot of pictures. <laughs> the definition of freedom and the will uh, to accomplish. That's exactly what books are for. I didn't think that, uh, that a space like this could provide me with, with so much in terms of, because that's, that's what learning does to you. It's the message that I want to share, what I want to tell through my poetry, you have to forgive yourself and give yourself that permission to be courageous enough uh, to experience emotions for what they are. Thank you. This is what it means to have a piece of mind. He won uh, the, the Library Poetry Slam a couple of years ago. Extraordinary story. And I think, you know, is it free? Uh, we forget, don't we? We forget how valuable that is. It's hard to imagine a more egalitarian place than the library, perhaps the MCG comes to mind, but it's one of the things I truly, truly value about my new role. It's a great privilege to help shape the next chapter in the history of an institution which for 160 years has offered patrons from all walks of life endless possibilities for free. Shortly before I left the ABC, I spoke to businessman David Sodi, who just left his job at Telstra and was preparing to take up his new role as chairman of the CSIRO. And he had a gap of a few weeks, and so he was telling me that he'd taken himself off to the State Library of New South Wales for a few days to read briefing papers and prepare himself for the new role. And around the same time, my daughter Ruby and some of her friends were spending their days at the State Library of New South Wales preparing for year 12 exams. So there they were, a group of 17 and 18 year olds and the new chair of the CSIRO sitting side by side in a library. Other organisations dream about developing spaces and services and products which transcend that kind of spectrum. But you've done that and you continue to do that. And very few of you that I've met talk in terms of transformation. But let me tell you that transformation is precisely what this sector is doing. You might balk at the language, but you're innovators. 
you live and breathe the kind of agile design thinking our politicians and industry leaders are so desperate to nurture. And you've gone from being the disrupted in some areas to the disruptors. For the past three days, that's what we've been seeing and hearing. And I think it's time for you to proudly own your success. And if you're uncomfortable with the language of change, innovation, agility, it's time to get over that. The library journey should be one of those stories that people like me in my former life look to and learn from as they navigate to change. Don't let others write the digital transformation story with far less compelling examples of success than you have at your fingertips. I greatly admire the humility of this sector, but no one is going to tell your story for you. The time to tell it is now, together, not as half a dozen separate voices within one sector, together. I look back on my sliding doors moment this time last year when I spent that afternoon in the State Library as life-changing. Twelve months on, I'm more convinced than ever that for those wanting to make a meaningful difference in the information age, the library sector, the sector that you have shaped and lead, is the place to be. I feel very privileged to have joined you. Thank you. I stole some of Kate's time for the DVD um, this, this afternoon, but is there anybody with perhaps one burning question? You are going to stay for a drink with us? Yes. I can't see. I think you stunned us, Kate. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Play. Give her a round of Thank applause. You. I hope you're feeling suitably engaged and enthused by that. It was a perfect end to a very good few days. It's my privilege now, um, to those of you who are here, to let you know about the special people who have stepped up and who haven't been part of the problem but have been part of the solution that have ended up giving us these great few days. I want to first thank the sponsors and exhibitors for their support. They are on the screen and all around us. Platinum sponsor, Taylor and Francis. Gold sponsor, Belinda Borobox. The University of Adelaide, Charles Sturt University, Press Reader, the University of South Australia, Aurora, ALS ePlatform, Bibliotheca and 3M. Thank you, well done. They weren't the only ones, of course. There was plenty others, um, and you all spent a very good time with them. I spent time today um, walking around each stand in the exhibitor hall, giving them their presentation, which is a certificate to say that they'd been there, just in case there were any snarky bosses back at home so they could put it up on the wall. And the feedback was fantastic. They all said that it was the best conference that they had been to this year. And that was because you asked them questions, um, engaged with them, um, asked them some hard questions sometimes about their products, but just about them as human beings. So thank you very much. So thank you to the delegates too. I want to say thank you to the speakers and presenters. Some of them started a long time ago, just put words down on paper. Some of their projects have been going for many years, some for months, and some were just an idea. If you've had an idea while you've been here and you think you might be able to put a, a presentation together, remember that we have a wonderful um, joint conference, Leanza and Alia, in two years' time. So that gives you a little bit of lead time. I want to thank now those people who did step up the committee uh, and the staff at Alia House. Um, so those of you who are here, and some of you I know who've had to run off and catch a plane to Paris, oh dear. Um, but uh, this is the committee, Bernie, Shane, Sarah, Annette, Terry, Pixie, Jeff, Diane, Anna and Liz. And the Alia House team, because we really couldn't have done it without you as well, Christina, Lisa and Bridget. Would you all come up here for very quickly?
a round of applause. It's now my special duty to do two things. If you've enjoyed being a delegate here, you'll probably enjoy being a delegate at the online conference as well, and that's not very far away. Um, I think that the registrations are now open. Yes, <laughs> good. Um, so that's easy. So you know, start saving those pennies and away you go. And also, of course, for our wonderful Save the Date, Alia and Leanza in a couple of years' time. Um, the, this is the 2018 conference is the fourth in a series which began more than 30 years ago. The first joint Australia-New Zealand conference was held in Christchurch in 1981, the second in Brisbane in 84, and the third in Wellington in 94. So save the date, 30th of July to the 2nd of August 2018 at the Gold Coast Convention. And again, just some positive feedback from you. Uh, speaking to some of the exhibitors today, they have already put it in their diaries because they had such a good time here. Um, and one of them in particular is making sure that they cut short their European holiday to be here in time for that. <laughs> um, Marion uh, Morgan Blinden, whom some of you have met, who's one of our valued board members, is going to be the leader of that conference committee and she would be very pleased to hear from you if you have any ideas or if you'd like to join her in helping to organise that. We invite those applications. Please speak to an earlier team member. Are you okay? You're going to have a nice evening? Thank you very much. The conference is over.